Hi everyone, Bernard here and I hope you're all staying safe and well and welcome to the Citizen Channels. We have a, a little player in time today, yes, uh, you'll know by the thumbnail, you know we're talking about a gentleman called Roy Paul, who was at City between 1950 to 1957, yeah, the ripe old age of 30 when he joined City, yeah, I can remember another skipper of City uh, sort of join a very advanced age and doing a great job and uh, this guy was was no different uh, he sort of joined City just after being capped for Wales um, uh, and he joined City from Swansea City on the 18th of July 1950 for a fee anywhere estimated between 19 and a half thousand and 25 thousand depending on who on who you read or what you read uh, I believe Mr Mr. or Sir Matt Busby obviously eventually uh, attempted to sign him for United as well, but uh, he had chose. I think he jumped at the chance of joining City. So we're going to have a quick look at uh, this, this City legend, because he is a legend. Uh, it didn't all go quite to plan for him. Uh, it wasn't all uh, roses and, and wine, you know. So uh, we'll have a quick have a look anyway um, about Mr. Roy Paul. And thanks for joining me for this little player in time feature. Please, if you're new to this channel, please push that subscribe button. I do these history vlogs, uh, city presents, city quizzes, lots of different things if you check my playlist. And also I have a little film and TV channel as well. So if you have a bit fed up of football, there's sometimes too much of it on, isn't it? You want to have a little break, uh, please please check out my film and TV channel as well. I do lots of film reviews, drama reviews, information vlogs, quizzes on there as well. So please check that out if you get a chance. And please, if you can leave your comments on this on, on Roy Paul say it's not a gentleman I saw play unfortunately I have seen the gentleman uh, I've never spoke to the gentleman but uh, I have seen the gentleman at uh, Main Road etc but uh, yeah if you know anything about Roy Paul yourself uh, just just let me know let me know in the comments what you think and if you can't give us any comments on this just give us a thumbs up be absolutely fantastic right yes Mr Roy Paul born 18th of April uh, 1920 so obviously as I'm recording this, uh, it's more or less uh, 101 years, 101 years ago. The village of Gethley Pentra, I think I, I think I pronounced that correctly. Gethley Pentra, it's not spelt like that, but that's I think that's how you pronounce it. In the in the Rhondda Valleys, of course, in Wales. Uh, one of 12 children, well, yeah, there wasn't much on the radio in those days, was there? So, yeah, 12, 12 children, uh, of course... As you'd expect, a, a sort of life down the pits uh, seemed to be the future for almost all the lads, obviously, in uh, of that age, of that time. Uh, obviously, other things would into into you know would actually affect that as well. Obviously, we're talking talking Second World War as well, aren't we? Coming coming up and things like that. But uh, yeah, but Roy would eventually escape that fate. Fortunately, he would uh, sort of sign as an amateur for Swansea Town. As a teenager, teenager, and then turned professional uh, for Swansea Town as well. But of course, uh, World War Two did interrupt this uh, footballing career, uh, where he once again worked down the worked down the mines, and then didn't quite adapt to that. So he went. He joined the Royal Marines. He couldn't swim apparently, but uh, he, he joined the Royal Marines as a PT instructor. There you go. As long as he didn't, as long as he didn't have to take him swimming, he was all right, wasn't he? And he played uh, wartime football, of course, depending where he was based. I mean, he either played up in Swansea. Or he played down. He was based in Devon, so he played down at uh, for Exeter City in the war years, which is what a lot of footballers did, of course. Uh, once the war was over and won and done and dusted, he did eventually make his league debut for uh, Swansea City. And after further four seasons, uh, yeah, he, he fancied a change. Um, the law of money and South American football sort of came calling for a lot of uh, British players at the time. And he was offered literally, I think it was about three thousand pounds to sign for this uh, Bogota, uh, Colombia, is it Bogota? Uh, three thousand, one hundred and fifty pound a month. I mean, this was uh, this was a king's ransom compared to what they were getting paid, obviously, over here in England and Wales, etc. Uh, there's going to be other perks on top of that as well. But uh, a couple of things he didn't like, obviously. In those days, it's, well, I suppose it was similar now. I suppose. I mean, you, you would uh, obviously the crowds were kept off the pitch by barbed wire and um, armed armed police and uh, big fences. So he didn't quite like that side of it. And I believe there is a rumor he did like a drink. This this uh, Mister Paul, he did like a little a little tipple, uh, to say the least. Obviously. Uh, and one of his mates who went over with him, because he wasn't an international, this guy, he, he actually wasn't signed on. So that sort of made made it that Roy Paul decided to come back. He didn't want to be over there without one of his 
let's let's say let's be kind one of his uh, drinking friends let's just say let's just say that so and say add that to the actual style of the football and what was going on off off the pitch over there he didn't quite fancy it so he came back but uh, yeah strange enough Swansea weren't very happy with him <laughs> for um, attempting to go over and, and obviously earn some money over there so he obviously he sort of implied he implied he wanted to leave didn't he so obviously Swansea put him on the transfer list and I think more or less City were one of the first clubs to come in for him. Les, Les McDowell was the manager at the time. Uh, and he did need... City had just been relegated literally that season. And he, he thought he needed a leader and was convinced this uh, this guy, Roy Paul, was a was lad to do it. And uh, we could stump up the cash. And, oh, even though he said, I said he was 30 years old. So it was take, probably took a little bit of convincing the board at the time. Uh, but uh, obviously McDowell took that chance and uh, I believe he didn't know much about City. He knew they'd been in the doldrums or he knew they'd got relegated because obviously Swansea were in the second division. So he knew City had been relegated. But obviously he was very kind words about City. He didn't realise how just how big they, a bigger team they were eventually, obviously when he's interviewed many years later. But at the time, it was just a matter of getting away from Swansea. So, obviously, he plumped for it. Uh, teams like uh, Arsenal had come in for him as well early on. But Swansea had blocked that. And, obviously, United, as I mentioned before, had come in for him. And they blocked that as well. But, uh, yeah, we stumped up the cash. As I said, it, it's it's down as 19,500. But I have seen it 25,000 at other places. Um, obviously, during that season, we did very, very well. And uh, we managed to get back to the first division at a first attempt and he did McDowell made uh, Roy Paul the captain as well that season obviously I think that was the plan all along of course and uh, we would finish runners up to Preston in the 1950-51 season which was the first season Roy Paul uh, played for City his first game for City had actually been against the uh, Preston North and the eventual second division champions uh, at Preston on the 19th of August 1950 and it was a, a quite quite interesting 4-2 win for City so we did get off to a good start but I said we didn't go up as champions that season we went up as runners up it's something you know we did go up as champions a lot didn't we for the second division he did play every game of that 50-51 season for City apart from away at Vetchfield there's all sort of conspiracy theories etc and why didn't he play and was it a gentleman's agreement that obviously he wouldn't play in front of the Swansea fans because of what had happened etc etc but I mean the simple thing was was that uh, he and Roy Clark had been called up to Wales and in those days obviously the internationals were played I think on the same day as uh, as normal football uh, league football so obviously he was playing for Wales so he couldn't he couldn't play against obviously Swansea at Vetchfield that was a simple reason rather than any sort of conspiracy theory or gentleman's agreement etc uh, he didn't, didn't score loads of goals. We'll tell you his goal, what he got later on. But his debut goal came at Main Road on the 23rd of September 1950 in a 1-1 draw with Luton Town in front of a good crowd. I think we actually had the biggest crowd in England. That Even though we're in the second division, I think we were the high, best supported team in England. I think I'm fairly right at that uh, from, from memory, from looking back at my little Manchester City history uh, vlogs. Uh, and he actually played at that game um, where he scored 42,312 spectators against Luton Town. So we were getting some really good crowds and obviously we'd uh, go on to get some great crowds, of course, later on when we talk about his FA Cup runs uh, a bit further in his career. But we did struggle once we got back to the first division, but... Uh, that sort of turned around a little bit with the emergence of another another wing back, another half back to play alongside Roy Paul, and that was a gentleman called Ken Barnes, who I think we know a little bit about, don't we? And this sort of led to the most successful little period at City in that latter part of his, his career, as he's obviously was coming to an end, he's getting to 34, 35, 36 years old by then. Um, and he captained City in successive cup finals, of course, and of course, he was also part of this famous Revy plan that came into being as well, which meant. Uh, City had also improved league positions by the time the uh, mid fifties had come round, so we'd sort of struggled a bit, but we'd end up I think seventh and fourth, I think respectively, uh, in the cup final seasons. Of course, he captained the losing team. Of course, in nineteen fifty four fifty five, a three one loss to Newcastle. We, um, we were down to 10 men, uh, Newcastle scored early, we went down to 10 men, Jimmy Meadows had to go off the pitch, so we did struggle, even though we got an equaliser, uh, Roy Paul did sort of galvanise the team, certainly for certainly for a half, but obviously tiredness sort of did creep in, you weren't allowed to substitute in those days, but uh, he was gutted when we got beat, obviously we lost 3-1 eventually to, to Newcastle, who were the favourites initially anyway, they were a great cup team at the time, Newcastle, but uh, yeah, we, we could act, we hung on for a while, but we couldn't quite hold on with the 10 men. 
and he did tell all and sundry. I mean, someone said he he told the Queen. I mean, no, I don't know how true that was, but he did tell his teammates, and there was a dinner at the night, etc., where everyone was a bit down. And he did tell them. Then, you know, obviously, Captain Sam Cowan, who had done similar thing in the thirties, of course, had promised that he would take City back the season after and win it. Uh, and of course, uh, Roy Paul promised more or less the same uh, but despite this confidence because he, he was saying tell, telling everyone we'll go back and win it but despite that confidence inside he, he was sort of admitted to journalists that he'd uh, seriously considered retiring so obviously he wasn't going to go back and win it again was he was uh, he'd been so devastated by this loss at Wembley which was one of his real ambitions in life was that was to win a cup winner's medal which a lot of footballers at the time is possi possibly more so than a league championship medal which which is strange to think these this day and age but so it certainly was them. Um, uh, there was rumours he gave his medal away. He certainly offered it a journalist because uh, he was so unhappy at losing that cup final. And it did take him a long time to get over it. But he did get over it and he kept his word. He led City back to the 1955-56 final. Uh, although we did ride our luck a little bit on the way to that final. I must admit it wasn't all easy going, but we're not talking about that now. But, uh, I mean, you're talking 70,000 plus crowds at Main Road for a couple of these cup games. As I said, our crowds were tremendous that season, uh, just for the league as well. Never, never mind for the uh, with the, that, that period for the, for the league games as well as the cup games. Um, and obviously this time it was a 3-1 win for us this time as opposed to a defeat in obviously what became known as the, uh, the Troutman final in the end. But... Um, yeah, sort of overshadow of other things that have gone. In fact, he'd, he had considered uh, actually uh, taking Troutman off. Obviously, we were winning the game at the time, obviously with only, what, 15, 18 minutes left or so. He had, he had sort of asked Bert if he wanted to go off, and uh, Bert Troutman, no, no, he, he asked to stay on. So, obviously, Roy Paul, as captain, almost made the decision to to take uh, uh, Bert Troutman in but off because obviously he was in, in obvious pain but uh, obviously that was a, a captain's decision to keep him on and obviously it all worked out okay in the end didn't it but uh, there you go I mean a journalist at the time said obviously accounting I mean Troutman got all the glory obviously but uh, that Roy Paul had had one of his greatest City games ever uh, at that Wembley final and inspired City to the vic to victory of course at uh, the ripe old age of 36 by now so he was uh, you know even in those days that, that was a, a good old age for, for a footballer and of course we won that we won that cup and his first job in the Wembley dressing room was actually getting all the players to sign the ball and then he presented it to his son apparently saying never lose that son it was the ball that won the cup for your dad so there you go that must be a, a great thing I mean he even managed apparently to let's let's say his drinking friends he even managed to smuggle some of his drinking friends into the changing rooms from the Ronda Valleys as well after the FA Cup and they were drinking out of the cup etc etc so yeah I mean a couple of the players did say it was it was like a a Welsh a Welsh village pub all the accents etc in, in the dressing room afterwards yep so that was his sort of he did stay at City another another year uh, we didn't do too great unfortunately but uh, he did leave City after the 56-57 season and his last actual goal for City came in a 2-1 win uh, on versus West Bromwich Albion on the 30th of March 1957 at Main Road in front of a crowd of just 26 3 7 one. So they'd uh, dwindled a little bit. Perhaps it had, I uh, don't know where they'd all gone, but there you go. His last game was actually at Goodison Park uh, for City on the 22nd of April 1957 in a 1-1 draw. He joined Worcester City, a non-league club, as a player manager. This sort of allowed him to commute from his home. Home is where the heart is. He's a, he was a real home body as well. He, he loved he loved Wales, uh, but that allowed him to commute back from his home in the Ronda Valley to Worcester and back. And even at Worcester, even at Worcester, he had a little bit of glory. And Worcester fans, apparently, the older guys to this day would uh, remember how he inspired them. A non non-league Worcester to Worcester City at the time. Don't forget, actually beat Liverpool. 2-1 in the FA Cup so there's the achievement in 1959 so he inspired that uh, and it was very soon after that a certain gentleman called Bill Shankly took over at Liverpool as well so there you go he, he probably inspired a change in management and we know how we know how that went with once Bill Shankly went to Liverpool well that was another another moment of glory for him uh, he sadly blotted his sort of legend status so this is the sort of Ups and the downs with City. Um, he's actually sold stories to the newspapers claiming he'd accepted bribes while playing for City to throw games against relegation-threatened teams. Uh, 
obviously most people think this was this was done just just for the money just just for the, for the money he'd, he'd done with football F football had finished he was trying to earn some money uh teammates of course were shocked by this and uh, couldn't understand what what he was talking about in no way were they party or had any knowledge of this but uh, most people think they just did it to to actually earn money and just 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 for the sake of actually getting some extra cash etc but uh so that was sort of did blot his copybook a little bit unfortunately but as I said, he'd been done with football. He was earning money driving uh, miners to various pits, and he was had become a lorry driver, etc., etc. Uh, and despite this this sad chapter, obviously, and the sort of bit of a bad taste in the mouth, uh, teammate and friend, City legend Roy Clark uh, said of Roy Paul, "I doubt if City ever made a better signing. He was regarded as the finest captain the club had ever had, and no one of my generation would argue with that." We used to call him killer. It wasn't just the opposition he frightened. Any City player he thought were not pulling their weight would risk getting a backhander. But he was also protective of his teammates and if any were having difficulty. He'd switch positions for a few minutes and sort them out. He was a true leader of men and deserves to be remembered as Man City's finest captain of all time. That was from Mr Roy Clark. Uh, Welsh football legend uh, John Charles. Uh, look him up if you don't know him. If you're a bit of a younger guy and you don't know him. Cited Roy Paul as his idol when he was a schoolboy. Newcastle legend Joe Harvey, another guy, said of Roy Paul, When I want to show a youngster how a wing half should play, I take him to see Roy Paul. He is the complete wing half. And even our own Joe Mercer, as I said, had tried to sign him for Arsenal, uh, had said he was one of the best footballers he had ever, ever seen. Uh, yet for City, he made 294 appearances. That's not too bad, is it, in uh, in seven seasons? Uh, I mean, it was up, up in the... Looking at the stats there, I mean, I think his lowest turnout in the league was um, 30... 35, 36 games, some stats on screen there, you'll see it there, but uh, that's not too shabby in seven seasons, isn't it? And he actually scored nine goals in total, so not too bad, but uh, that wasn't his main trait, obviously. And he'd also played, made 33 appearances for Wales, with just one goal for Wales, so that... That was interesting. Uh, yeah, his last years were spent in a nursing home close to ho close to his home in Glamorgan. He also suffered sadly from dementia later in life. He passed away on the twenty first of May two thousand and two at the age of eighty two, and he's actually buried in Triorki Cemetery. So if you're ever in that area, it might be worth a little visit. Yeah, in two thousand and four, this is the hall of the original Hall of Fame, but he was one of the the original fifteen city players inducted into the City Hall. Hall of Fame. I think um, Roy Roy Clark's wife collected the the thing on on his behalf, on his family's behalf. I think that day in twenty nineteen. Yeah, we got the the famous blue plaque was put above his uh, unveiled in the village of Gethley Pentra in the Ronda Valley. Uh, obviously on the side of his house. So there you go. As we go, if you go to there, there you go. Another place, Gethley Pentra. Look look for that blue plaque uh, for Roy Paul. Uh, it was put there in, I think it was 2019, I think I'm right in saying that, so, uh, so something else. So you've got, you got Triorki Cemetery, and there you go. I'll have a trip myself, one day, we get this COVID over, so I'm doing this, we've got the COVID thing still going on. Um, might have a trip myself, that should be, should be fantastic. A blue plaque was unveiled on his, on his home in uh, the village of Gethley, Pentra. Yep, so thanks for joining me, hope you, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, any, say, any memories you have of Roy Paul, uh, Thanks for joining me this Player in Time special feature. Looking at a uh, great captain by all accounts. Let's forget about the other thing. I mean, at the end of the day, as I said, he was a hard working and he enjoyed a drink, this guy. And he was a pro proper guy of the time, I suppose. And uh, But what a captain he was for City. What an inspiration to many players as well. And uh, as I say, he's a sort of, sort of, I always look at you, always, you'd always say, don't you? The guy you want by your side in the trenches and... Certainly Roy Paul looks as though he was that type of player, wasn't he? That type of man. So there you go, Roy Paul. Between at City between nineteen fifty and fifty seven, seven seasons. Fantastic. Anyway, what are we gonna do the rest of the day? Have a great one. Look after yourselves, look after your friends, look after your families. More importantly, let's all look after each other. Till we meet here again on the Citizen Channel, or perhaps you have a flit across, have a look at my film and TV channel. All I ever say is please stay safe, blues. Come on, City. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.